um, had the occasion to introduce uh, Dr. Prendel before, so I'm going to do pretty much what I did the last time, since most of you know her here. In a quiet, peaceful village, there is one we love so true. She ever gives a welcome to her friends, both old and new. She stands serene, mid treetops green. She is our dear Otterbein. Now that is the Otterbein love song, at least the first stanza, and you do not want me to sing it. <laughs> but I think it's very, very fitting um, as we uh, honor Dr. Krendel today. This is one of her last big speeches, so it's the first of many lasts. So um, we'll get through it. Um, she's been <laughs> so we hope. We, we will get through it. Um, she's been such an inspiration to me, and I know many of you here in the audience. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't need to give her the big bio um, speech. We all know who she is. We all know what she meant to this institution this community in Westerville as well, um, and Central Ohio. She's really, really brought Otterbein from that quiet, peaceful village to what it is today, and some of the great successes that, that she has shown. So without further ado, Dr. Kathy Prince. Thank you, Debbie. So with that opening, um, tears are probably going to come at some point, so just please bear with me. Um, um, I, I guess um, before we start, I just wanted to ask you um, as a group to consider um, one word that describes Otterbein for you. So if I could just have a few, I was going to have you write this down, but we'll just do this orally. So give me a word that, one word that describes Otterbein. Community. Community. Friendships. Friendships. And Friendly. <laughs> oh dear. Impressive. Very good. Home. 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 Okay. Okay. Any others you want to volunteer? Inclusive. Okay. Curious. Okay. All right. So these are all nice terms, right? And I guess what a lot of what I want to talk about today is what was I mean when uh, when Debbie gave me the the idea of um, a legacy, it got me thinking about I don't know what people will say about my legacy. Um, but a lot of the words that you've volunteered are words that I associate with Audubon. Um It is a uh, as, as Debbie said from the Audubon love song, um, it's a place that is defined by its people and by its welcoming nature, by its inclusive orientation, um, and it really works as a community. It's a place where people are friendly. It's a place where um, I, I guess I continue to be amazed that our students actually embrace the idea of a Kindness Matters campaign, and that was something that they were willing to talk about and promote as part of the culture of Otterbein. So I guess I want you to frame this, um, for those of you who know Otterbein well, um, think back to 2009, and I'm going to do um, a little bit of a, a historical overview. Because one of the things, people have been sending me a lot of things um, and saying a lot of very nice things. But one of the things one of our um, alumna sent me was um, the TNC edition of the 125th anniversary of Otterbein. And I was looking through it. Uh, this was the year that President Tom Kerr was um, inaugurated as president. And one of the articles um, on the opposite um, side of the page about presidents was um, an, uh, an article called, The Presidents, Do They Ever Do Anything? <laughs> and it, it gave me pause, um, but I thought, okay, if I look at this and go through it and think about how were other presidencies, how other eras were characterized, what are the um, implications for me and how does it help me think about my own um, era and my own presidency? So. I just wanted to give you a few details uh, from this article about what did presidents do. Um, some are just interesting and some I think are early indicators of who Otterbein is today and who it was in the past. So think about the connections between what was then, what was said about the presidency, uh, presidents and what is said now. So um, during his first term as president, so Reverend Lewis Davis did two terms as president. 
He organized the debate societies and established rules and guidelines for uh, what they called social interactions. One rule was that ladies must not receive visits of a young man or be in his company without special permission. Think about today, I, well, you can do this on your own. Um, <laughs> on campus, there was to be a distance of 10 feet between the boys and girls. He also enacted, along with the trustees, a compulsory labor system as part of the manual labor movement of the time, requiring that all students spend time working in the Audubon farm and garden each day. Does that sound like anything we do today? community engagement, the community garden, the promise house, all of the ways in which we uh, warm. I see Scott here. Um, where are you, Scott? I saw you here. Okay. <laughs> the partnership we have with Westerville Area Resource Ministry. Um, students are actively engaged in community. They are developing, they are producing food for those in need, both in the community and on our campus through the promise house. So that idea of community engagement, that idea of giving back, that idea of service to others was really fundamental uh, very early on in the history of the institution. Also, I always note the first two graduates of Otterbein were both women, Kate Winter and Jenny Miller. They completed their degrees under President Davis. And of course, the founding of our institution was based on the principle of co-education, with men and women on equal footing, with the doors open to both. Graduation requirements were the same. I was talking with someone from Oberlin the other day, Rebecca. Um, Oberlin, where's Rebecca now? Okay, so Oberlin admitted women prior to Audubon being founded, but when we were founded, they were a male institution who then embraced women later on with different degree requirements, I might add, because they didn't think women could endure the rigor of an undergraduate education. Otterbein said, you know, let's open the doors to both. Let's just, and that goes back to, harkens back to our core value of opportunity, diversity, inclusion, um, and uh, bringing everyone together on the basis of equality. Um, so that's a very important moment in our history. In 1859, Reverend Alexander Owen was serving as president when William Hannibal Thomas, our first African-American student, enrolled at Otterbein prior to the beginning of the Civil War. That again anticipates our commitment to diversity and inclusion today. President Thompson was the sixth president of Otterbein and he asked the trustees to consider, it had been a few years since the founding, he wanted them to look at the constitution of the student body and here's an excerpt from a report that they issued in 1876. I find this very charming. The men who founded this university had no previous experience in the management of institutions of learning. In admitting ladies into the college on the same terms with gentlemen, in permitting them to recite in the same classes, take the same course of study, and receive the same degrees, they builded better than they knew. Having boys and girls in their own families, they felt as much interest in the success of one as the other. Not being able to build and man separate institutions, they wisely concluded to put both sexes into the same school. After 29 years of successful experience in the co-education of the sexes, we believe that better results are secured in mental and moral culture, better discipline obtained, and a more harmonious development of character produced than in the old way. We are willing to be judged by our fruits. Observation will show that our lady graduates are just as ladylike and scholarly as those graduating at female institutions of like pretensions. While our gentlemen are just as refined and have proved themselves to be as efficient workers in the battle of life as those that have been trained in male colleges. What was adopted of necessity then is a matter of choice with us now. On this point, the faculty and trustees are a unit. And of course, again, diversity, opportunity, inclusion, um, it was very fundamental in terms of that early review. But that idea of they had boys and girls and they thought they both should have equal opportunities is at the very core of an Audubon experience. And obviously it takes on new meaning today as we think about other audiences coming to Audubon. Another, another thing that President Thompson wrote during his presidency was he thought a president should be a teacher as well as the faculty. He should go before the class with as much preparation as the others. And of course, this speaks to my heart because I've taught the Women in Leadership first year seminar um, since, uh, since 2010. So then moving ahead a little bit, another noteworthy event took place, and I can't resist saying this. In 1891, under the presidency of Dr. T.J. Sanders, Audubon was in its second year of a football team, and they beat Ohio State 42-6. to six. Yeah. 
that was a moment. And it said it said in the article that he was thrilled by this event. So, um, all right. So anyway, um, there was one other um, interesting note that I think again anticipates um, the future and kind of builds the foundation for the future of who we are today and what we represent today. Um, in 1958, there was a lot of student conversation about a term EUB, uh, which historically had had served as the designation of the Evangelical United Brethren, our church affiliation. But they took it to mean everybody unbiased, EUB, uh, 1958. And that was a, a phrase from the students that they used to talk about what EUB meant on the Audubon campus. So again, those same kinds of values about the importance of being fair-minded, treating people respectfully, and thinking of everyone having equal opportunity. Okay, so I, I found it interesting and I don't know, entertaining, um, to read through the legacies and the, um, the kind of labels and the kinds of events and activities that were associated with various presidents. And that sort of got me speculating a little bit about how people would characterize my presidency and the last nine years. Um, so when I think about it, the things that immediately come to mind are that I will be known, I will be remembered as the first woman president. And that's, you know, that's great. Um, we were founded in 1847. We didn't appoint a woman president till 2009, but we did it. Um, so that's a good thing, okay? Um, but there are some, I don't know, some sort of darker things that I could sense <coughs> coming down the pike um, early on. And that was when I was the first woman president who made us change to university. That process was well underway by the time I arrived, uh, but my, um, my predecessor didn't want to do that on the way out, so he, they'd done a lot of questionnaires, they'd done a lot of surveys. The big question, if you can believe this, the big question was, in the Otterbein love song, the phrase is, Old Otterbein, our college. And people were just, you know, what are we going to do about that? We can't become a university and still sing the love song, and the love song is the way we end every celebration and so forth. And it's like, well, that's a nod to our history. We'll still sing Old Otterbein, our college. Problem solved. But there are still, I'm sure there are still some people out there. I just, I can't help but say the word college. I just can't help it. And that's, that's fine. Um, or another one that I, I think will probably become true. Um, the first woman president who allowed alcohol to be served on campus right here on Prohibition <laughs> Row. Remember, that was a student-driven initiative. The students did the research. Um, they did all of the, the background um, examination of what has happened at other schools when they have permitted alcohol on campus. And I don't know, um, Bob, how long that policy is, um, but it's, it's uh, you got to get through that policy before you can have alcohol on campus. Let's just put it that way. It's not like you can just be selling alcohol on campus. Um, so but the students put that all together, went through the whole governance process and brought it forward. So I like to think of myself as the woman who approved a great research project by students, which allowed us to have alcohol on campus <laughs> occasionally if we followed the policy. So, uh, Okay, anyway, so then I decided that maybe what I should do is instead of making assumptions about how my um, presidency would be characterized. Maybe what I should do is go back and look at what I said when I was inaugurated. So the cover of Towers on the left was um, based, the sort of theme was the inauguration. And the one on the right is um, the one about my retirement. And I actually look happier in the second one, I think. <laughs> Not sure about why, but anyway, um, so I, I went back and my, they published some excerpts of my inaugural speech in uh, 2009. And, um, and I w went back to look at it to see what was really on my mind, what was I thinking about at that time. And so um, this is going to be sort of a little bit of the then and the now in terms of um, my presidency. And uh, we'll come to kind of, so what does all this mean? Um, so the theme of my inauguration was reflect, connect, and act. And the quote um, that was included on the first page, the front piece of the story about the inauguration, um, had the following highlighted. I want to pursue that image of a shining light as we reflect on the history of Otterbein College and connect its origin in the mid-19th century with the 21st century and beyond. So that was the quote. And then the conclusion of my speech was, I would like to challenge each of you to abandon the idea that Otterbein is a hidden gem, a well-kept secret. People kept saying that to me everywhere I went. I really didn't think that was a good branding. Roberto, not a good branding. Yeah, no. <laughs> 
Um, in the days ahead, I ask each of you to reflect, connect, and act in your own way on behalf of Otterbein College. Carry the light of learning out into the world, and in the process, let us pledge anew that we will be true to our dearest Otterbein. That's a phrase, again, from the love song. So I guess what I wanted to talk about a little um, is the process that that reflect and connect and act um, kind of title um, led me through what I thought would be a way to go forward. And it had a lot to do with connecting the past and the present and the past and building the, the foundation for the future. So we started um, with a retreat at Chautauqua, and I assume most of you kind of know the history of Chautauqua. One of our trustees at the time uh, was a board member there at Chautauqua, and this was one of those places where people come together really from all over the world, but in particular all over the country, Chautauqua, New York. It's a peaceful, I don't know, serenic, um, serene, um, spiritual kind of place where great speakers come in, great ideas are shared, great debates are held, a lot of reflection on social challenges and, and um, issues facing our society. Uh, great authors, uh, great poets, great music. Um, there's a theater program. It's all about um, this immersive experience in, ex in uh, kind of exploring ideas and thinking about um, solving problems, I guess would be a way to think about it. And so that Chautauqua retreat included faculty and staff and community members and trustees. Um, the cabinet uh, was all there. And um, it was really an opportunity for people just to kind of talk about Otterbein and uh, what it meant to them, what its history was about, and what they saw as some of the challenges ahead. Um, it was an opportunity for people from across different audiences associated with the university to get to know each other a little bit and to hear their ideas and thoughts about um, challenges facing the institution. Remember the recession had hit, um, we had had some significant financial challenges, and it was a time to step back and think about the future. How did we um, position ourselves for a successful future? Um, and so um, what we talked about was um, the idea of coming back to campus and beginning to develop a strategic plan. Um, and the idea was to spread out the conversation to include more people. So over time, we included more than 300 individuals once we got back to campus. So this is moving from kind of the reflection part to the connection part. Um, there were still reflections going on, but again, students, faculty, staff, alumni, the Alumni Council, Becky, we had the Alumni Council involved in this discussion. Um, everybody uh, from the, were, was invited from the community. I did community meetings. Um, and the, um, the thought process was really around reflecting on Otterbein's past and thinking about Otterbein's future, but focusing specifically on those core values that I thought really characterized our culture and our community that were fundamental to the character of the Otterbein, um, the Otterbein educational system, the Otterbein commitment um, to students and, and our alumni. So that was really the focus of the um, conversation. And um, I brought with me, and I, I know many of you have these, but um, what happened in the process of this connection part um, was that we began to develop a strategic plan that had um, specific objectives, specific activities associated with it, specific goals. But we developed um, the phrase, a model community. And, and everybody who's a new employee at, at Audubon has gotten one of these, but in case you don't have one, um, I will pass these out. I have a box of 100, so there are plenty for everyone. But the idea was to put on one card the core values, the guiding principles, um, the, um, the way in which we wanted to proceed as an institution, our vision and our mission statements. And the mission, is who we were at the time when we wrote this. And the vision statement was an aspirational statement about who we'd like to become. And that's where the phrase, a model community, came into play. So it's not that you could ever say, oh, we're a model community, done, check that one off. Um, that wasn't the point. The point was that in decisions we made in the processes of recruitment, in the processes of retention, in the processes of graduation, were we exercising 
were we exercising our values, were we applying our values to the decisions we made and the way we organized and operated as an institution. And there were times when um, an individual would show up in my office and say, um, I don't, I don't know if you're living by the values of Otterbein, so are we really demonstrating equality and opportunity and diversity? Are we really embracing those values? Are you really being as transparent as you say you should be in the guiding principles? Are you really living according to these values? Probably not always, um, but having them in print, having everybody have a copy of it, and when people were comfortable raising questions, I thought that was a good indication that it was really out there. Um, some of you may remember we recently had a speaker um, on campus for the um, faculty workshop in the spring. I forget what that's called. Great expectations. Um, and he posed the question, he said, you know, I've been doing a lot of research on Audubon to try to get to know you a little bit. And I kept running across this phrase, model community. And he said, I, I don't really know what that means. I looked up the word model and it showed beautiful fashion models and it showed model planes and it showed model cars. And, but he, you know, he's like, I don't know, I really don't know what you mean by model community. And I, would, I took a deep breath because <laughs> I was afraid, I was really afraid someone would say, oh, that's a phrase the president uses. And, you know, it doesn't really mean anything. But actually what someone said was, well, it's an aspiration. It's what we aspire to be. Um, it's something that um, we want to live and, and work according to our values. So to me, um, over time, what happened was Otterbein um, began to really think seriously about the way in which our past um, connects with the present and also how it builds the foundation uh, for the future. So the, uh, the fact of the, uh, or the, going back to the reflect, connect, and act, the action part um, really started after we did all of the connections, um, went out into the, into the community. And what that going out into the community allowed us to do was not simply um, talk about Otterbein, um, but we actually listened to people talk about the community of Westerville and Central Ohio community. At that time, I see Tanny here, I was um, serving on a couple of boards that took me out into the broader community. Um, Tanny was uh, chair of the I Know I Can board uh, for a number of years while I was serving on that board. and. I mean, it was, it was great because I learned a lot about Columbus City Schools and I learned a lot about the way in which I Know I Can was committed to helping students who were going to have challenges getting to college, both financially and academically, how they could help those students succeed. And I would come back and I would say to Jefferson, you know, here's what we need to do. Here's what we're seeing in the data at I Know I Can in terms of student retention and student, you know, there was a, a lot of drop off from students after their freshman year. Um, they were getting an, a financial award, but they didn't necessarily have the support structure they needed. So that's how we launched the Columbus Partnership, the Columbus City Schools Partnership, and, and provided the first um, founder scholarship from an institution, a free ride uh, for a student to come here uh, with the idea that we would create the support structures. Um, so many of you have been involved in the Bridge Program and some of the programs we've developed. Many of you are involved in the Mentoring Program, uh, where we meet individually with our students. But the idea of seeing what was in the community and what was happening in the community, connecting those, those dots, making those relationships stronger. Um, you see this with the city of Westerville. There are many things we do now with the city of Westerville that we were not able to do previously. Um, I need to watch my time a little bit. But I remember when I first arrived at Otterbein, the city council had dinner with me and it was a big table and almost to a person they went around the table and said, we just want to tell you, you need to go west. And I was sitting here thinking, uh, okay, what does that mean? They didn't want us encroaching further on the neighborhood of Westerville Village, uh, Westerville Town, Westerville Community. They wanted us to go um, west of Alum Creek. Um, there was property available. Um, some of that property is still available, but we did acquire um, 25 acres of that land. And of course, that's where the point is located and communication and art are located there. So we'd already started that migration. We already owned um, the facility that became the point. We already owned the communication and facility, but they were, there was this division, there was this understanding that this is where Otterbein stops and this is where Westerville starts and we don't want you to cross that line. I don't have those conversations with the city of Westerville anymore. That is not the way we talk about things. We've got partnerships through the library now with um, the, the public library in Westerville and the Otterbein Library. We have all kinds of partnerships in, in terms of the, the five cardinal experiences. Warm is another great example of the way that 
excuse me, the community has embraced Otterbein. Um, there are partnerships developing around athletics with sponsorships and so forth. Those, those barriers, nobody draws lines anymore. It's very much, we are a community, we are an inclusive community. One of the exercises we did um, as members of the Westerville Partnership, which is the schools, Otterbein, city council, chamber, I see Janet here, thank you for being here, um, and the library. Um, we actually did an exercise where we each brought our core values, the core values of our organization to the table. And there was a remarkable overlap in terms of the way in which we thought about our service to the community, the way we engaged with the community. And I, I think, Janet, you said at one meeting, um, a model community, that kind of defines Westerville. And it certainly uh, is what we aspire to be, I think, as a community um, at Otterbein. Um, so those were the sort of I guess the steps that the connections took us then to the points of action. And that led us to developing um, the strategic plan. Um, creatively entitled strategic plan, um, <laughs> 2014 to 2020. Um, but the idea was, um, it was real. I mean, we really wanted to do this and it was a strategic plan. Um, but you'll notice it, there were a lot of pictures, historic pictures and hearkening back to that past um, and the core values and so forth. And then we came to core values and guiding principles principles, again, keeping these in front of people um, to hold us accountable, and then went on to identify um, specific, um, specific strategies, priorities, and goals that were based on really going back to that Chautauqua exercise in terms of what was Otterbein's past and what was its future and how could we connect the dots on that. So we took the big ideas from the retreat, we did the connections, um, all of those were laying a foundation for uh, building on that process of reflecting and connecting and acting. And I guess in my mind, I don't think we could have done many of the things we've done um, in terms of building community and performing some of these actions and realizing some of the goals without having laid that foundation of building trust, building relationships, building partnerships, building collaborative um, initiatives. So I think that the, um, the final probably, um, I, I guess my final uh, project is really the point, which for me really brings everything together because it is a crossroads of the community, business and industry, and Otterbein, so it's education and it's innovation and it's, um, the, com it's the broader community. Um, you can be an individual member and use the makerspace, you can be a business and be a tenant, but all of it is focused on the student experience. Those students need to be in there every day, mixing it up, colliding as they say, as the architect said, colliding with everybody else, with all the partners. And I think at this point, um, maybe Willie, we could show the video and then we can talk a little bit more about what we're trying to do there. I don't know of anything uh, in this region that is like this. This is the point, the exact location where education, industry, business research, and government are meeting. Not only is the point changing how students learn, it has the potential to distinguish this university and its long-standing partner, the City of Westerville. It also stands to serve as one of the most innovative and unique assets in the entrepreneurial ecosystem of Central Ohio. There are a lot of innovation centers across the United States, either linked to universities or uh, just independent. Um, what we believe is really unique about this facility is that we've brought the community in, we've brought businesses in as tenants, and we've brought our academic programs all together, collaborating in one facility. Um, and it's not necessarily entrepreneurship based or student startup based or student directed based. It's really about the collaboration and the partnership and the great things that we can create um, and develop with those partners all together working um, in the same facility. This has been a, a dream come true for us uh, to be able to uh, have a place to go where we, we have the capability, we have the facility uh, and the equipment to do what we need to do to create solutions. It will allow us to have an environment in which our engineering students here at Otterbein will work alongside of practicing engineers on projects for the companies who are resident in the center and with our industrial collaborators who bring projects to the center. 
The work that is happening here will give students, corporations, businesses, and community partners new perspectives about how things can and should work. It will be a model example of all that collaboration can produce. The point is what happens when you have the right partners in the right position at the right time. The vision and the execution is significantly bolder than what I frankly first understood and imagined. And um, as you know, coming in and seeing it for the first time and then also being a resident here uh, over the last several months, um, there's just a significant energy in, in this facility and in this um, at the point that gets me really excited. I think it's actually going to be one of the um, uh, biggest things to happen, if you will, from a maker perspective, so in the hardware development um, here in, in Central Ohio. At the point we are integrating and applying classroom learning as students engage in industry projects from prototype development to capstone experiences to internships, working side by side with industry professionals. They will come to understand the process of moving idea generation and product design to the marketplace. We've done as much as we can from an applied learning perspective. Um, we're integrating design thinking and problem-based learning into all of our programs that are here um, and really being able to offer the students an opportunity to go uh, from the classroom into the lab and then perhaps even then going one step further and going into a business partner uh, to work in the afternoon. I think that gives our students this, this opportunity that you wouldn't get anywhere else. What I really like about the program is the fact that they're integrating uh, not only the theoretical work, but um, also the ability to, for the students to apply that theoretical knowledge in the labs. Um, they seem to be able to uh, complete projects, um, articulate those projects to an audience, and explain how they came about um, their logic, and demonstrate uh, the designs and, and uh, the different concepts that they put together. This building has become physically transformed but so has our partnership, so has education for the future. This is just gonna be, I think, the best thing ever, and I'm so excited that, to see this as it, as it progresses. Just as Towers Hall has served as the iconic facility defining our past, the point will serve as the physical manifestation of Audubon's future. The future calls for experienced problem solvers and bold mindsets. The point is where these leaders will learn differently. This is how higher education works in the 21st century at Otterbein. So um, I don't mean in any way to suggest that this is the end. To me, um, the, the end of an era is kind of the beginning. Um, it's really a beginning. And so I've said repeatedly, if I come back in five years and the point looks exactly as it looks, and of course it will all be done. Safety, inspect, life safety um, is good to go and, um, and we're set. Um, so we'll be opening it um, a, a little bit um, in the next week or so. Um, it will no longer be hard hat territory um, and so we'll have all 61,000 square feet. But to me, um, as I, 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 I guess I'll reflect on this in a minute, but for me the point represents when I talked about that shining light that connects Audubon's founding in the mid 19th century with the 21st century and beyond in the inaugural address, that's the kind of thing that I think does that. It takes the values, the idea of integration, community, collaboration, bringing everybody together around a common educational mission. Remember you can't be, you can't be in the building unless you provide student experiences, so it's about the student experience but everybody owns it. So when we talk about in our, um, when we go back to our, our mission statement, that idea of we educate the whole person in the context of humane values, and we're a community of educators, leaders, and learners um, in the vision statement, everybody on this campus is part of that educational process. It's not the job of the faculty, it's the job of every one of us to educate our students. It's the job of our students to educate us. That's the definition of our community. Um, but this is only the beginning of what I see as um, the future for Otterbein, that connecting the past and projecting it into the future. 
Also, I guess I should say um, there have certainly been some other very important um, steps forward. And again, I don't think we could have achieved these goals without the foundational work we did around reflecting and connecting and building those aspirations and strategic plan. But we're about to announce completion of a $50 million campaign, which is the largest campaign in Audubon's history. And remember, a lot of that money, the idea was to invest in students first. We were seeing debt, in, debt uh, levels for students uh, increase. Uh, we froze, froze in tuition now for four years. Um, that's unheard of in higher education today. It has not been, I understand, without sacrifice on the part of our institution, but we did it for the students. And that has made a difference in their lives. Um, the, um, the dual admission program with Columbus State is going to make a difference in students' lives who cannot afford a four-year degree. But they will get that four-year degree under our relationship with Columbus State. So I don't want to point as the point at the point as the sort of sole and single, but it's a good demonstration of what I was thinking when I gave that inaugural address, that we shouldn't be stuck with thinking of Otterbein as a Westerville located, quiet, peaceful village, serene environment. It had to connect, it had to go out, it had to engage the world. That's what our students have to be able to do. They have to be prepared to do that. So I think that the efforts we invested in terms of reflecting and connecting really laid uh, the foundation for us to move forward. We built a lot of trust, we built a lot of relationships, and we created a shared vision that made the campaign possible, that made the point possible, and will make other things possible in the future. So in my mind, as I reflect on my legacy, um, it's not my legacy, it's our legacy as an institution. And it's our legacy that will carry us forward into the future. And this is where I'm getting sort of, all right, just get the Kleenex ready. So uh, what we demonstrated, um, I think, by going through this process was that we had to go backward in order to go forward. We had to understand who we really were before we could really move forward and be not one of 53 private institutions in the state, but a distinctive institution in the state a destination for students who care about values and who care about other people and who value diversity and opportunity and equality. And that's what it was about. So um, let me skip through some of this. Um, <laughs> um, the idea of, um, well, in the course that Wendy and I teach now, the leadership course, one of the first things, I don't know if I can do this. One of the first things we talk about is knowing yourself. And so we do Myers-Briggs and we do other assessments, we do strengths finders. Um, we do a number of exercises that help students who are first semester freshmen. Who are you? You know, do you know who you are? Don't, don't make yourself somebody you're not. Um, build relationships with people who are going to appreciate you for who you are. That's what Otterbein had to do. And that's what we've done over the past nine years, I think. I think we value and appreciate Otterbein for what it is. Know your values. I think one of the great benefits for me as president has been that Otterbein's values just happen to be my values. I care very much about the things that we stand for. We actually embrace that idea of our values. How many institutions embrace values in their, in their campaign statement? Where we stand matters. That's what we represent is a values proposition about progressive values in this world and opportunities and equality for our students. You have to know your community as a leader. That's why I spent so much time listening the first couple of years. That's why we did all the reflections and all the connections. You have to engage with your community. And I think we've done that as an institution, not just me. We have people all over this institution who are out in the community, participating in community service and doing community projects and representing us on boards and, and organizations. You have to listen and you have to stay engaged. Debbie always talks about this as what is your leadership practice? These are the things I'm walking away with. Engagement, listening, reflecting, connecting with people. And that has enabled us to move forward, I think. So I think the, I'm not sure where the reflect, connect, and act came from. Um, as the inaugural theme, I, it wasn't entirely mine. I think it was something else like to act and connect and reflect or something, but it seemed to me we needed to reflect first and then we needed to connect and then we needed to act. So I don't take credit for that, but it became my roadmap in terms of how we would go forward. And I, I wasn't sure what the net destination would be. I wasn't sure 
where it would take us, but it seemed like the right roadmap to use as we went forward. And the final thing I'll say is that um, relationships matter. Relationships matter a great deal. And that's something else as a leader that I think is fundamental. So I was going to close with a quote from a letter, which I maybe can get through. Um, her name is Jane Norris Williams, um, out of my 1938 grad. And she wrote me this letter. I got it uh, right after I was appointed and Towers Magazine came out. So, she said in the close, this woman's story was an amazing story. She had gone, we had a relationship with a mission school in New Mexico. And she had gone there to teach after graduation. And then she set out for what she called it, the territory of Alaska. She went to Alaska to teach um, native citizens in Alaska. She was bringing education to the, to the um, out in the frontier. Um, and so she went through her story and how she had tried to serve people and how she had practiced that idea of service to others and, and brought education to people who needed it. And she closed her letter with the following. When I read the towers and learned of your appointment, I looked long into your eyes and sensed the determined and forgiving smile. That led me to wish you the best of opportunities, maybe abiding campus, and the wonderful folks and students there crown your days with joy. And all I can say at this point is that we have. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> control. So <laughs> if you have questions, <laughs> um, if you have any questions, I, I didn't know how long I would take, but um, if there are questions, I'd be happy to, to take them. Or if you just want to watch me cry some more, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, Scott. So uh, as a transitioning leader, what you see as the key challenges for Audubon now facing in the next five years not only through the transition of presidency, but in light of our culture and how we move forward. Yeah. We've reflected on that now. What would you see? Well, I think higher education isn't done with challenges. Um, you know, we're seeing, um, yeah, again, the state of Ohio is challenged just by the, po this pop the pipeline population coming through. So I think it's been declining now for a few years, and there's going to be a big drop uh, in another few years. Um, so population is one challenge. And you'll see, you know, what, one of the things that I'm very proud of the cabinet uh, for doing is we've really worked hard to anticipate rather than react. So we have some plans, don't we, Jefferson? Uh huh. Um, in terms of how to uh, to deal with some of these issues, but one of them was the dual admission program um, with Columbus State for kids who might not have found their way to Ottermine. But I think the enrollment uh, is a big challenge. Um, and yet, at the same time, and higher education isn't very good at this. We tend to respond to do more of the same rather than thinking differently. Ottermine's been trying to break out of that, but the people who need education now are people who are in the workforce. Um, jobs are changing. Jobs are disappearing. Um, they're going to have to learn more technology skills, me included. Um, you know, I think that um, the, the generation of individuals who got industrial factory jobs, those jobs aren't going to be there. And so, I mean, I, I guess um, there's a group in town um, that um, is doing projections in terms of sort of big data analytics of what jobs are going to disappear. There are a lot of jobs that are going to disappear in the very short order. Um, so thinking about lifelong learning isn't just a a, a sort of interesting thing to pursue. And we have a couple of lifelong learners here <laughs> right before me. Um, it's, it's great um, to be able to have the, the luxury of exploring learning that's interesting to you after you retire. But lifelong learning is going to be a factor for people who are now in their 40s and 50s and early 60s. They're going to live longer. They're going to change careers more often. And they're going to need to be developing new skills continuously. So we're talking about that. I think also there is, um, and I, 
I've tried hard at this. I think um, I think God of mine has tried hard. Um, there's a great deal of cynicism about public and, and private education these days. Um, and part of that is the proprietary schools that you pay your money, you get your degree kind of thing. We don't work that way. That's not our value proposition. It's a very real uh, commitment on our part to provide educational opportunity and to provide the kind of experiences we provide for our students. But that's not to say we can overcome that public cynicism. So it's costly, uh, no question about that. Um, it's a different kind of experience than a lot of individuals think. I could just sit at home and do this and get my degree and that would be that. So you have very different, I guess, hurdles to overcome. So the, the unique character, the value proposition, um, making it clear to people why education is important. And, and that is um, one thing that I think everybody here really believes in. I, I think I don't know who I was talking with. I've talked with too many people. But their comment was, I guess if you want to make a lot of money, you don't go into education. That's true. Um, this is not a place. We're not here for um, big salaries and, and big titles and things. We're here really because we believe in education, the power of education to transform lives. And somehow we have to overcome that public cynicism. And that's going to take more than um, you know, one institution. There was also an article, I don't know, last week or week before about we spend a lot of money and time competing with each other rather than saying education should speak with one voice. Isn't there a way just to say education is important? There are many avenues to get there. So choose the avenue that's right for you. We have to change the way we tell people about education rather than everybody needs a college degree, period. That's not what it's about. Yeah. That's a very good question, and I was supposed to talk about that, wasn't I? So we have a leadership certificate program. Do we have any flyers back there by any chance? Okay, so we happen to have some flyers and materials. So one of the skills, as we've done our analysis working with business and industry, as we've talked with folks about what's needed, they keep talking about soft skills and leadership skills that they can't find people. We have tended to migrate to very narrow training for individuals, so they might be a really good electrical uh, engineer, but they're not so good at communicating. I, I don't mean to use that stereotype. But, um, but the idea of helping people be a team player, knowing how to collaborate, knowing how to problem solve, knowing how to work together, understanding people from different backgrounds, those soft skills and leadership skills are what we hear a great deal about. So we have had a leadership certificate program for a long time, but we're rebranding that and marketing it for individuals who are in the workplace who want to advance their skills. And that will be available this fall as it was last fall, but we're sort of promoting it now as something that's more about lifelong learning. Um, so, and you can get materials on the way out. Do, Jefferson, do you want to say anything more? Christy, do you want to say anything more about that? There will be more coming uh, along those lines because, um, as I said, the need for continuous education is becoming more and more critical. Yeah, Tanny. Well, first of all, thank you. Um, been such a wonderful role model. So, on a personal note, um, as I've always looked to you as being such a wonderful role model here in the community. What's your next chapter and how your leadership does not end here? So how do you think about <laughs> Leading as a grandmother, um, <laughs> that's probably not going to be exactly my job definition. Um, so I am. So I've talked to a number of presidents, and what they have warned me about is overcommitting. And so I am undercommitting. Um, so I have agreed to serve as an executive search consultant um, with one of the firms that does higher education searches, which will keep my foot in the door uh, in terms of education. There are four universities right in the immediate area that we're moving, where we're moving in Virginia. Um, and so my husband is already teaching at Radford and Virginia Tech on a part-time basis and they talked with me a little bit about doing some of that. Um, they're also, uh, this is App Appalachia, um, once you get outside Blacksburg. And so I've inquired from a number of different um, individuals. I've met with what they're doing around women in leadership and I keep getting this sort of like, what? And so I think there's an opportunity there um, to help create um, a, a I, I, I guess a platform for women interested in aspirational goals. And so um, I need to um, connect with uh, some of the folks who are already, I mean, the one thing I've learned is listen to the community, figure out what's needed. The reason we launched, I guess I sh could say that, the, and then I'll stop, but the reason we launched the Women in Leadership program the way we did, there was one reason, and that was faculty were saying, and I heard this every day, you don't understand how hard it is to do all new preps. 
because we were going from quarters to semesters. And I thought, I've always taught as an administrator, I'm going to teach here, so I'm going to feel your pain. I'm going to share this, you know, this burden. Um, and it's been great to be in the classroom with first semester women. It's just been great. It reminds you of when you were 18 and you left home and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, there are lots of choices and I could make some really bad ones. So um, we try to, to help them through that process. Um, but the idea of of creating those opportunities for women and some of the students from that class have gone on to be student trustees and student leaders and resident assistants and student government leaders and so forth all over campus. Um, but they kind of need permission. Um, it's, they kind of come into the room, and I've told this story a lot of times, we meet in the trustees room and they come in and they look at those chairs and they look at that table and they look at that wall of portraits of all white men looking at them and they just are uncomfortable and they finally you know you say take a seat and they kind of perch on the edge of the seat and by the end of the semester i hate to say this to our facilities folks but they're crossing their legs on the chairs they're sitting you know indian style they're doing all these things that are um you know really they, they own the space they finally own the space and um giving students permission to do that, giving women permission to speak when they're the only woman in the room and to own um, their position, to own their space. Um, that a lot of kids in Appalachia and a lot of kids everywhere, a lot of girls everywhere need that permission. So I'll do something like that, but I, I just don't wanna, I am, you know, I do have two grandkids and I do wanna have, I haven't been able to have much time with them and I would like to have maybe a weekend here and there, or maybe a Friday night movie, I don't know, but um, sometime, some downtime. I guess I would say, um, I, I think many of the cabinet members feel this, that uh, back to Scott's question about the challenges for higher education. It's, um, you know, it's kind of a, many jobs I guess now are 24 seven, you can't get away from it. You know, it's email, it's text, it's um, seeing messages coming in, worrying about what could happen, or do we have all the risks? Rebecca worries about risk, we do all kinds of risk assessments all the time. Um, and you know, are we doing all the things we can to protect our students to make sure they're safe? Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a huge responsibility. And bearing that responsibility um, is, um, a privilege, um, but it's also a lot of responsibility, and it, um, you know, there there are days when you just think, I, I just need it's time. I'm getting old. It's time for me to step back. So, um, so I will be passing that responsibility on to a very well positioned and very competent cabinet, um, and a new president um, who's an experienced president and will step into the role effectively. So, so I don't know yet. I just want to take my time. And I'd also, after living in the president's home for nine years, much as I love it, it's not really my home. And so I'd, I'd like to have a home. So, well, I want to thank you all for being here today, for bearing with me during my emotional um, uh, moments. Um, but it's really, I meant what I said, it really has been um, a great experience for me. I've grown a lot, and I think Ottomine has grown a lot. So, thank you. So I see Tanny doing one of these. It's like, uh, okay, deep breath. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, what a great partnership it's been. Um, it's been great to be back on campus. And she's the reason I met her <laughs> at an alumni event um, in Upper Arlington, selfishly. I went because I was running for council, okay, and I wanted to meet the people that were there. And I met, I met um, Kathy, and I thought, she's someone I need to get to know. And um, I married my sweetheart here from Otterbein. And uh, you lived in a professor's house. We lived in Dr. <laughs> Hancock's house for two or three years, or, or first two or three years of our um, marriage. And um, so we, we had connections, but we kind of lost those connections. So it's so great to be back connected, and she's the one that drew us here. So, um, and again, with the Ross leadership would not be what it is. Um, she, when I was working, where's Katrina? When I was at Franklin, um, and we had the leadership lessons down there, Dr. Krendel, when she first got here, came to speak. And she pulls me aside and says, I want these at Otter. And I said, hey, well, I, I'm kind of working down here now. But let's work on that. So, um, you know, three or four years later, here we are. They will continue, I promise. Right. 
Promise? Yeah. Promise? Yeah. Okay. In fact, we're going to take July off because we're going to make sure the point was done. And um, so in, in um, August, we will have Sandy Ahern Doyle, or, who will come from emh and Tandy's coming this fall, too. I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> we're going to get her here. <laughs> oh, see how that ask goes? It's really pretty easily. Sandy is a female engineer, runs a big engineering shop. She'll, uh, she'll be, I, I, she's really excited about seeing the point. Yeah. yeah. So, and we'll be back at the point then August 21st. And again, thank you. Um, thank you. I, you know, what Otterbein has become through your leadership, I love the fact that you said um, Otterbein's values were my values, because that's what a true leader is. And you've got to make sure that your values align with what you're leading. And that's the most important thing. And I think that's your legacy yeah. there. And we all forgot the, the, the one word that we leave you with is kindness. Right. Yeah. Go be kind. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, this is a great, great institution. It's a great community. Go out and spread that. So again, thank you for coming this morning. Thank, thank you. you for your, you. For your uh, uh, leadership here. And go have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you.